tourism is slowly getting back to normal as borders reopen and travel restrictions ease in Southeast Asia. But another challenge is how to invest in tourism for generations to come. And in Manila, heritage conservationists are looking at tourism to raise awareness and help preserve historic sites. Such sites are an important part of what gives a city its character, sense of community, and history. This packed downtown Manila district, Hope Campbell, located at the heart of the city, is known for cheap barking hunts, a growing Muslim community, and the Philippines' most attended church that celebrates an annual religious feast joined by hundreds of thousands of Catholic devotees prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Less known even to Filipinos is Campos Hidalgo Street and its place in the Philippine nationalist movement that arose during the Spanish colonial era. Conservationists want the area declared as a heritage zone to accord protection to Campos' colonial era houses that survived World War II when much of Manila was decimated. Hi, to raise awareness, advocates are tapping on the local tourism market through regular identity reinforcing walking tours. Kiapo resident Dennis Barcelo serves as my guide. Meron akong fulfillment pag natatel ko yung story ng Kiapo. Mga students yan, usually students na lumalapit sa amin. And then mga random people rin in all kinds of profession. Here, you have to be mindful of passing vehicles and bear the city's unpredictable weather for an hour or two. Caressed by the sun one moment and interrupted by rain the next. Still, walking is a more sustainable way to explore Hidalgo. The tour starts at the over a century old San Sebastian Church, the world's first all-metal church now under threat from steel corrosion and aggressive development near its vicinity. There may be modern developments that could actually affect the very structural integrity or even architectural integrity of the basilica. They should know what the condition of the building is. Perhaps after that consultation, then they could develop plans that are respectful to the actual condition of the heritage buildings. Water leaks at the church's dome go through its 132 hollow metal columns, corroding nearly three dozen of them. Multi-million Philippine peso mock-ups of what can help stabilize a column is done in one of them to be replicated in others. Most of the parishioners of the San Sebastian Basilica are students, many of them coming from provinces outside capital region, Metro Manila. So when face-to-face -face classes were suspended due to the COVID-19 pandemic, fundraising activities for the conservation of this church also took a hit. But near the church's entrance, you can see this replica of the church with a donation box where you can put cash donations to help in the rehabilitation of this national cultural treasure. The Capo Tour's most prominent feature is the Bahay na Pil Bautista, a so-called Bahay na Bato, examples of which still stand along Hidalgo. They are Filipino homes with a mix of influences during the colonial era, enhanced by indigenous knowledge to adapt to Philippine climate. Bahay na Pil Bautista was once home to members of a Philippine revolutionary group that fought against Spanish colonizers. Architect Joel Rico helped conserve this house and many other old Filipino homes, an endeavor which he says requires community involvement and correcting the notion that art is elitist. But he adds, the science is important to preserve artistic structures in quake-prone countries like the Philippines, urging structural engineers and architects to work together on heritage conservation. More than the heritage, more than the, more than the historical aspect of the structure, it is still a public structure. So public safety is still paramount. All of us should realize and should accept 
and should work towards that goal, uh, public safety in preserving heritage structure. Maintaining historic homes is resource intensive, so advocates urge real estate tax exemptions for owners in exchange for keeping tourism alive in their property. Tax exemptions on tourism-related profits of these heritage homes are also sought, which churches and nonprofits already enjoy in the Philippines. Newer ways of visualizing can help the public reimagine old Manila, like this 3D rendering and modeling of Manila's cityscape prior to World War II by a group of heritage conservationists. This ongoing so-called Digital Manila project by Renacimiento Manila covers the city's heritage trails, not just of Quiapos Hidalgo Street. The project made use of archival photos of pre-war Manila and the prevalent architecture and mode of transportation during that time. We aim to create the scenes of Manila during its pre-war years because that's the time that Manila was famously known as the Pearl of the Orient due to its beautiful architecture and urban landscape. Digital tools can be used first as an educational tool for us to appreciate our heritage, our history, and our culture as Filipinos. Renacimiento Manila's founder says the project is an ode to Filipino architectural geniuses of colonial times, which inevitably, for better or worse, shaped the nation. What we are now is a product of historical processes, and it is best translated in built heritage that we see in Manila and in other parts of the country. So this identity fused together creates what is the Filipino. Architect and educator Harvey Vasquez says heritage conservation can not only reinforce national identity, enhance neighborhoods and create more jobs, but they're also better for the environment. When you talk about sustainability, when you talk about stretching the boundaries of our budget, heritage conservation is at the key of it. Because uh, when you build less, because you're able to reuse and, um, and uh, recategorize structures, it would save more budget for more important aspects like healthcare, uh, food uh, security. So we are gaining enormous amount of uh, nation-building um, components. Like much of Southeast Asia, the Philippines is a former colony. This shared experience gave rise to intensified nationalism at the time. Filipino elites, a number of whom stayed here in Hidalgo Street, became thinkers, doctors, and artists like the painter the street was named after. They gave back to the nation and the reform movement at that time. But the old times have gone and the challenge is evolving. Modern day heroes are now needed. Through awareness raising sustainable tourism can hopefully help conserve Manila and this now neglected Hidalgo Street, a place rich in history, once known as the city's most beautiful street, now suffering from urban decay. Malaysia is a popular destination for medical tourism in Southeast Asia. With the relaxation of border restrictions, many foreign patients are coming to Malaysia to seek medical treatment. And so hospitals and industry players say that medical tourism is bouncing back after a lull during the pandemic. As soon as Malaysia reopened its international borders in April, Indonesian Mustafa Kamal rushed to make a medical appointment for his mother at a specialist hospital in Johor. It took the family a long two-hour ferry ride from Batam. But the journey and higher costs overall were worth it, he said, knowing that his mother would be able to receive quality service and treatment here. Kita sudah berobat di Batam beberapa kali, namun kita mau hasil yang signifikan. Selama ini mungkin ada perubahan tapi tidak kurang maksimal. Jadi kami mau bawa ke Johor ini supaya lebih 
tahu lagi penyakitnya, tahu uh, medicationnya. Kami harap ibu kami lekas cepat sembuh. Saya bawa keluarga ke sini dengan kualitas yang ditawarkan, ya kita percaya. Since April, KPJ Johor Specialist Hospital has been receiving an average of 10 foreign patients a day. But some are new patients, most of them are here for follow-up treatment. This after medical appointments were postponed during the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2019, the hospital treated more than 18,000 patients from 86 countries, mainly from Indonesia and Singapore. The industry suffered a heavy blow during the COVID pandemic, but now that borders are reopened, the hallways of KPJ Johor are buzzing with international patients once again. It's an indication that Malaysia's medical tourism sector is back on track to become a leading destination for international patients in Asia. Prince Court Medical Center in Kuala Lumpur remained optimistic throughout the pandemic and was always ready to reopen its doors to international visitors. Over the first five months of this year, the number of medical tourists at the hospital grew by an average of more than 50% monthly. The reason is because for a fraction of a cost, they could get the same level of care of what other countries could provide. Our specialists, our healthcare providers, our hospitals in Malaysia uh, can provide uh, world-level kind of treatment. So I think they could see it was cost-benefit coming to Malaysia. Uh, we attraction to come to Malaysia is actually very high. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just healthcare, what comes with it. Uh, we have got very good destination uh, in Malaysia, holiday resorts, beach resorts, hill resorts, and that's, I think, one of the main attractions of coming back to Malaysia. Malaysia's medical tourism industry is expected to continue growing with a projected annual revenue of more than 450 million US dollars in 2025. That's about an 18% increase from their total revenue of 390 million back in 2019. We've seen that uh, the growth of arrival of patients coming to Malaysia has doubled uh, month over month uh, since 1st of April. And that, have shown, uh, that shows some indication of the confidence level that the patients has to Malaysia. And we are happy to see this. The core objective that we want to focus on, especially within this year, is always the patient safety and security. Uh, with that in mind, we want to always develop our strategy or develop our program uh, around the patient itself. We want to enhance the patient's experience when they come here. Of course, medical excellence uh, is always the top priority, the quality of the healthcare services that we provide. But any optimism comes with caution. After all, the COVID pandemic has changed the way people travel. The airline industry is developing quite well and they are now growing their flight connectivity. However, it's still not enough for people to start to travel flawlessly as before. Number two, the cost of travelling is also still at a higher, I would say, level. One of the key things that also a challenge for us right now is that when it comes to border opening, uh, it has to always be in a global sense or it has to be done uh, collectively by other countries as well. Moving forward, the council plans to work even closer with private hospitals in the country to champion the medical tourism industry. This includes ensuring medical and service excellence while beefing up international branding. The council also plans to expand to other markets like the Middle East as it regains its momentum to provide quality and affordable healthcare as a safe and trusted destination. Now, with the reopening of its borders, Malaysia hopes to leverage on its historic and cultural sites to welcome back tourists. It has big plans to turn UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Lingong Valley in Perak State, into an international archaeological destination. But unlocking its potential remains a challenge. Sandwiched between two mountain ranges on the fringes of Lake Chenduro near Sungai Pera, about a three-hour drive from the capital Kuala Lumpur, lies the lush green Lengong Valley. It's the gateway to one of the oldest prehistoric settlements in the world after Africa, spanning over a million years. 
Listed in 2012 as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, open-air cave sites and stone tool workshops scattered over 1,000 square hectares. Archaeologists believe that these caves may hold secret to a lost world. Boardwalk was built last year during the lockdown to connect these caves as Malaysia prepares to welcome back tourists. It's really tight at some of these caves and you really have to gently squeeze through. Now they are all together, 70 caves in the entire Lengong Heritage Site. Now only six were excavated and discovered. Now this is one of them, it's called Gua Asa. I'm going to check it out. Now this cave is one of the most important caves in the Lenggong Heritage Site. It contains evidence of prehistoric human lives from 14,000 to 2,000 years ago. And skeletons were discovered right here. Our guide, Nash Jalaluddin, spent years documenting these caves. Some are steep and require quite a bit of climb, he said, to get to. A cave is similar like the uh, strong room of a bank where you deposit all your precious belongings and then keep there for a long time. So that's what K is actually doing to us in terms of archaeological findings. All right. These caves were said to be the home of the so-called Para Men, discovered by archaeologists from the University of Science, Malaysia, some 30 years ago. It's said to be the most complete set of prehistoric human skeletons on Earth in Southeast Asia. Through 3D virtual reconstruction, scientists were able to give him a face. Now, this was probably how he looked like. Now, archaeologists believe that he is someone well respected, like a shaman, based on how he's buried at the center of the highest cave in Lengo, along with all the artifacts. Despite the discoveries, our guide, Nash, lamented the lack of public interest in these archaeological findings. We will celebrate the 10th year that being inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Still, Malaysians, uh, they don't even know where Lenggong is. And then they, they, they only know perhaps maybe Perak Man, but then uh, they are not really sure why is it Perak Man is actually contributing to UNESCO World Heritage Site. But some of these archaeological sites are difficult to access and information available was sketchy at best. At the moment we can't get in. Mm. Uh, we have not got the permit, yeah. so we're just venturing and have a look yeah. and see how the place is. But all these are going to change, according to Thing City, that's tasked to develop and promote the Northern Malaysia cultural corridors by leveraging on its historic sites and rich biodiversity. Funded by Ministry of Finance with support of local authorities, Thing City's Managing Director, Hamdan Majid, has big plans for Lengo. It's actually the beginning of a long journey, because this is not something that we realise in the short haul. How do you kind of uh, polish the gems and, and make it more visible for people to kind of hey, realise that there's a lot in your backyard that you don't realise? That, that you know, people around the world are showing great interest, like Lengo. What we are doing here could add value and contribute in significant ways, kind of create that offerings that people will want to stay longer. And spend uh, more, and, perhaps. And probably, yeah, you know, especially when we build the capacity of the local economy. <laughs> wow. For starters, grants were offered to community-based enterprises to develop a sustainable ecosystem of local products and services. And these include food, traditional trades, homestay that are curated to broaden and diversify visitors' experiences. More investment, he said, is needed to build capacity and improve existing amenities and infrastructure in anticipation of a surge of tourist arrivals. These places were never organized or prepared to receive visitors. So obviously, you know, um, you, if you ask, are there enough rooms, are there enough for guides, are there enough, what I would call, amenities and services that can cater for the needs of visitors? Now that is it's always the case of chicken and egg. Now what we're doing in the grant is actually encourage people to take the risk, to start investing. Many community-based enterprises are coming on board. They include Fatima, who is looking forward to boost sales, having emerged from a protracted lockdown. She's providing visitors a hands-on experience in making traditional cooling powder known as Bada Sejo that's made from fermented rice. 
And the ladies of the village really believes in the special properties of this special cooling powder. Now, Makcik Fatima, apa keistimewaan pedak? Keistimewaan dia. Bila kita pakai tu dia rasa sejuk, muka kita jadi cantik, jadi lalus. Lepas tu kalau kata siapa anak-anak yang kena ada ruang apa, boleh pakai dia. From sharing beauty tips to family recipes, these ladies from Lengong were out to impress. Madam Noraini Othman was eager to show me how to make a local salad using freshly grated coconut with all kinds of herbs that are organically grown from her backyard. Punya kasi sini. Oh, so it's more ladylike. Side way. Open try. It was an appetizing buffet spread straight from the farm. Tak ada pakai baja, tak ada pakai racun. Dia tumbuh-tumbuh le, ah ni tepi-tepi sungai aja. The fish, which is a local delicacy called bakasam, were caught from nearby lake. Although not a natural lake, Tasi Jendero is picturesque. Today, it's a source of livelihood for many in Lengo. Asmari Ahmad, who supplies fish to the Bakassam cottage industry, hopes for his business that was hard hit by COVID-19 pandemic to recover soon. For the young people, they don't know. Perak men have here it's a big, big gift for all Lengo. School trips are organized these days to Lengo to raise awareness among children about archaeological discoveries and the rich biodiversity surrounding the valley. It is, after all, their heritage to appreciate and protect. Now, all peace and quiet at Chenjuro Lake. Sunset cruise to end the day after a busy day visiting all the archaeological sites. As Lengong Valley falls to sleep, time stands still at Lake Chandero, waiting to be discovered and explored. <laughs>